Uh, not too long ago, I uh, was reading a Bible study outline guide by Wayne Jackson, and it is outstanding. I thought we would share some of these things from this article <coughs> today regarding the Bible as the Word of God. We allege, of course, as Christians, that all of our decisions pertaining to the moral things in life, ethical decisions we make, religious decisions we make, have to be approved by the Bible. In other words, we say that we let the Bible guide our lives and in, in, in all aspects of our life. How do we live each day? What kind of employee we should, should we be? What type of father should we, we be? And all of these things, we say that we let the Bible uh, guide our lives. And that's, that's true. That's what we want to show. But here's the question. How do we know the Bible is right? How do we know the Bible is right? Because if it's not right and it can be disproved, then all of those things that I've just mentioned, we've been using the wrong guide and therefore there is no guide. How can we know that the Bible is right? Uh, in that article, Jackson gave three different points and we're going to explore those briefly this afternoon. Number one, he said the Bible cannot be disproved. Secondly, the Bible cannot be displaced. And number three, the Bible cannot be destroyed. Our hope this afternoon is to strengthen our faith that the Bible is the Word of God and then make some closing comments about how thankful we ought to be for that. Only when it comes really to the Bible, I mean, we could, we could talk of this about other literature, but only the Bible is up to this standard where we have to strive to prove or it has to prove itself. You think about ancient, uh, other ancient pieces of literature. We don't, we don't say, well, you got to prove that or we don't look for mistakes so much in this ancient, um, pieces of literature, but the Bible stands alone in that it has to prove itself over and over and over. And the reason for that is because the Bible claims something that these other books, most other books do not, and it is this. The Bible alleges it is the Word of God. And so if it's going to be a statement made like that, well, then it ought to be able to stand under some examination. We ought to be able to look at it and examine it, test it, and see whether or not those claims are true. That claim that the Bible is the Word of God is made over 3,800 times alone in the Old Testament. 3,800 times that it is the Word of God. You think about it, all those, you think, well, how in the world is that possible? Think about all the times it says, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. That alone, boy, you're going to get that count up. But in so many other places, it claims to be the Word of God. And this is an interesting thing to think about. The Bible contains two types of information. Number one, that which is verifiable. In other words, some historical uh, data, some scientific data and the like, some things that you can verify. You look at other parts of history, you will say, well, yeah, that is true because this, 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 and this. And then the unverifiable. It talks about where our soul goes, uh, what happens to the spirit uh, at death, and some things like that that cannot be uh, verified. In other words, we can't say, well, you know, I've I've been dead. I was in heaven. Well, of course, Paul said that, but I can't say that. I've been dead. I've been to heaven. I've seen what it's like. This is what it's like. I've verified it. I've tested it, and therefore I know this is true. And so, how do we know that that part is true? Well, by looking at what can be verified, and if those things are true, then what can you do? You can trust those things that we will have to wait and to see about. You understand? So let's first of all look at the first point. The Bible cannot be uh, disproved. Recently, and I say recently, uh, it was actually 1830. I wasn't around then, were you? Uh, 1830. But recently, some records were discovered of ancient Assyria, and they refer to the kingdom's conquest of Judah. So in 1830... Sennacherib's prism, this is a picture of it right here. It's now in the um, Oriental Institute in Chicago, Illinois, and you can read this. And so you read 2 Kings chapter 18, and then you dig up and you find Sennacherib's pr uh, prism. And it's amazing that all of those things that were said in 2 Kings 18 were also said in this prism. Now that's amazing. Now he did leave a couple of things out. You know, anything negative... <laughs> about somebody who's writing history, it's interesting that that's usually left out of history, isn't it? In other words, if I were going to write my autobiography, 
I want to tell you about all the good things I've done. And I would probably leave the chapters, although there could be many chapters written, I wouldn't want to tell you about all the, the boneheaded things I've done in my life. And so Sennacherib's prison was dug up and it confirmed everything that is found in 2 Kings chapter 18. That's just one of, of so many others. But here's another one that to me is even more fascinating. When you think about the voyage and shipwreck of Paul, we don't have time to read all of this. I wish we did. Acts chapters 27 and 28. And I know you can't really tell much by that map, but you see that the red line is uh, where he was on his way to Rome and where he suffered shipwreck and all of those. Read that when you have some time. But here's some neat things about it. I want to give you a couple... I've given you one up there, the openlibrary.org books, The Voyage and Shipwreck of St. Paul. That was written by a man uh, by the name of Jefferson White uh, and Evidence and Paul's Journey. And uh, he talks about also, Brother Jackson did, James Smith's book. That's The Voyage and Shipwreck of St. Paul that you see up there. And then there's another book, and you can write this one down and look at it later, uh, some evidence of Paul's journey on the way to Rome. And here's the neat thing about this. Did you know that in these two chapters of the Bible, there's more information on ancient sailing and techniques and routes and what to do in emergencies and all of those? Listen to this. There's more details in those two chapters of the Bible than all other ancient literature that's ever been found regarding ancient sailing. Two chapters of the Bible. And here's the thing. It's all right. It's all correct. Now think about that. You know, Luke was a physician and he was a great one, no doubt, but he wasn't a sailor. How in the world could he know all of those things and all of those terms and all of those what to do in this case, what to do in case of emergency and, and the, the, the words he used, the techniques he uses and all of these things. How in the world could this doctor in two chapters of the Bible, two chapters of literature, say more than all the other ancient literature did about ancient sailing techniques. And we could go on and on and on and on, but that's not the purpose of this. It's just to get us to think about this. How in the world did uh, Noah know the perfect ratio to design a weight-bearing barge? A man who had never built a boat in his life, most likely, Maybe not even have seen it rain, let alone seen it flood. How, how did he know that? How did Solomon know about the rain cycle in Ecclesiastes chapter 1? How did Isaiah know that the earth was circular, Isaiah chapter 40? And you could go on and on and on and on, and it comes to one conclusion. It cannot be disproved. Do you realize that everything that we found regarding the Bible in all things, in history, in science, in every other way, once we find out, once we discover something, we say, well, you know what? The Bible said that all these years ago. Did you know air has weight? Job did, the ancient patriarch. Did you know there's paths in the sea? David the shepherd boy did. Psalm chapter 8. Over and over and over. How in the world did they know these things? They were ignorant shepherds, some of them. Yet every single time we discover something and compare it to the Bible... When the Bible speaks of that subject, it's always verifiable. Isn't that awesome? Could you imagine in just, well, I'll use myself, 48 years of my life, and you just put your name in there and put your age number in there. If we could go back and record everything that you ever said, do you think we would ever find one instant where you made a mistake? Would we ever find even one instance where you said something that you thought genuinely was true and you find out it was completely false? I tell you one that <laughs> Mindy and I just discovered this year. Uh, on the way back from Indiana and, and to uh, Memphis, we pass a federal prison, so we thought. And we go coming to the lectureships for years and years and years. Every time we would pass it, I was, all right, girls, look. That's the federal prison over there on the left, if we're going down to Memphis, it's on the right, if we're going to Indiana. Look, girls, that's the federal prison. That's where John Gotti was kept. And, you know, just name some of the horrible people that were kept there, or the horrible crimes that these people committed that were kept there. 
Well, Mindy and I were on our way by ourselves, and I was telling her, you know, same old speech. Boy, just think about what those walls could talk, you know, what it would say. Well, Mindy Googled it, come to find out we've been wrong all of these years. <laughs> it's a minimum security prison. <laughs> <laughs> they put the, the, the least criminals there if there's such a thing in there because it's not that well fortified. Now, there is another prison that's true, but you can't see it from the interstate. Oh, man, I just knew. I knew that that was right. But just one quick Google search proved, no, Mark, you don't know what you're talking about in this. But here's the point. How about 40 different people writing over 1,500 years? Moses never met Paul, yet every single thing they say regarding the same subject agrees perfectly together. Is that amazing or what? It cannot be disproved. And we could go on and on. I know I keep saying this, but the Hittites, boy, they scoffed at Bible believers. You crazy Bible thumpers. There's never been a Hittite nation that has, uh, that has ever lived on this earth, and yet the Bible, the Old Testament especially, talks about those Hittites. You don't know what you're talking about. Guess what they found? The ancient Hittite nation. And not only did it exist, but it prospered, and it was so powerful. You see, the Bible's right, and it cannot be disproved. Number two, the Bible cannot be displaced. The Bible was completed 2,000 years ago, and guess what it continues as, even to this day, the best-selling book. I mean, with all of the attacks against it, guess what is still the best-selling book in history of this world and continues to be? It continues to be the Bible. And although critics many times have tried to undermine it, tried to destroy people's faith in it, yet it continues. And why, we have to ask, would they seek to discredit the Bible? Well, here's the reason, and this is the important reason. Because if you admit that the Bible is true, then what's that mean? That I either have to align my life with its teachings or be condemned by its teachings. And so if your heart is such to understand, to believe, and to not want to strive to live your life according to it, then your only other bet can be, i got to try to discredit that thing and I have to try to attack it. If the Bible were merely of human origin, then why hasn't it become obsolete? These people who have tried to suggest that they have come out with the thing that's going to destroy the um, trustworthiness of the Bible. They come out and they're just so dogmatic about it, so strong about it. If they are right, then why is the Bible still the best-selling book? Why is it still around? The Bible's description of the origin of the universe has not been scientifically discredited as we've been studying here in the auditorium class on Sunday mornings. Man, has that class just not strengthened your faith so much? It's so powerful to prove that God is and that he created it just like he told us he did in his word. And then the last point, the Bible cannot be destroyed. It cannot be displaced and it cannot be destroyed. As we've already said, no other book has had the hostility towards it than the Bible. And it, and it makes sense in some ways. You know, one of the things about some of the ancient literature, um, it doesn't promote itself, most of it doesn't, as God's word. And so the Bible does that. And that is a pretty strong statement to make. And so it does have a lot of hostility towards it. But it cannot be destroyed. Jeremiah chapter 36, King Jehoiakim burned the prophecies of Jeremiah. Yet the Bible remains the Greek ruler, Antiochus Epiphanes, criminalized possession of the scriptures. As a matter of fact, Jason Jackson wrote an article on that. I put that hyperlink up there for you. Uh, Daniel's prophecy of, of, of that same man talked about, he, he criminalized possession of the scriptures. And that was back in the day where the Greeks were the strongest. They ruled the world and they were the most powerful. And, and if someone like that said, you better not have... A possession of any scriptures, then you know a lot of people would listen to that talk. Yet here it is, 
the Roman emperor uh, Diocletian banned the Bible, yet here it is. And then listen to this last statement. Despite their efforts, watch this, more than 5,000 copies of Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, 5,000 copies date back to the second century, just a few years after the death of the last apostle. Now, just to kind of give you some context of how awesome that is, 5,000 copies. In other words, you destroy one copy. It's all right, we got 4,999 other ones. Have you ever wondered, and, and I'll just I'll say this because I can't think of another way to say this, the Catholic Church who claims to have given the world the Bible, that's, that's their claim. The church gave the world the Bible. It's completely the opposite of that. The Bible gave the church. It tells you how to be the church that you read about in the Bible. But even if that is true, their claim is the Catholics gave the world the Bible. Then why in the world are there so many things in the New Testament that condemn their very practices? Have you ever wondered about that? If I was the one that was going to give the world the Bible, then it would agree with everything that I, that I was practicing. So, so then why do the teachings of the Bible condemn the very, some of the very things that they do? And here's why. Because there are too many copies out there. If there was just one copy, yeah, they could change that one. But there's way too many other copies to change. And so they've got to go with the facts. You can trust the Bible that you hold within your hands as the Word of God. Now, here's that. Let me, let me repeat this because I got sidetracked. Let me get back to the point. More than 5,000 copies of Greek manuscripts of the New Testament that date back. This is, the, this is the, the interesting part. That date back to the 2nd century, just a few years after the death of the last apostle. Here's what's awesome about that. You contrast that with the fact that our earliest copies of Homer, and you've heard that, if you read that, the Odyssey and the Iliad and all of those things, the earliest copies of Homer date 2,000 years after the Greek poet's play. So when he put that play on, the earliest manuscript we have of Homer's writings was 2,000 years after the fact. Question, does anybody doubt that the uh, Iliad and the Odyssey were written by Homer? No. Yet it was separated by 2,000 years is the oldest manuscript we have of that. Yeah, think about this when it comes to the Bible. Over 5,000 copies within just a few years after the last apostle's death. And guess what people try to say? Well, it can't be verified. <laughs> The Bible, above any other book, is the most verifiable book that's ever been written. There's so many copies of it. It's right in every way, not only spiritual matters, but historical matters, scientific matters. All of these things, it's been proven right. It's been tried to be displaced. It's been it's tried to have been destroyed. Yet the Bible remains this bible that you hold within your hands how many copies do you think you have in your house right now man i tell you what i, I don't even know the answer to that myself <laughs> I and mean, if you include the library you know my library uh, i have no idea what the answer to that question is but did you know in some countries The work that the Gudums do in India, everybody who completes the 25 lesson Bible correspondence course receives a Bible. And I wish you could see the looks on some of those people's faces when they hold a Bible for the very first time. Have you seen that clip on YouTube of those Chinese people who received Bibles for the first time? the tears that flowed down their face, the jumping up and down when they never believed they would be able to hold a copy of the Word of God in their hands. And they were just overjoyed when they finally got one. How many Bibles do we own? 
Could it be that even we as Christians sometimes fail to remember just how awesome this book is? Everything that can be verified, think about it, has been found absolutely flawless. So if it can be found to be verified and everything that can be verified, then what's that say about the promises that are also found there? There is a God. You have a soul. If you follow the teachings of this book, when your body dies, your soul will continue to live forever. How do I know? Because the Bible tells me so. Are you a Christian this afternoon? If you are not, analyze it, study it. You want to study with one of us? Let us know. Let us, let us introduce you to this great book. Let's learn these things together. If you believe the teachings of this book, but you've not yet acted upon them, will you do so today? Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Will you repent of your sins? Will you confess your faith? Will you be baptized into Christ? Because that's what the Bible tells us to do, to have our sins washed away. Will you do that today? And then will you live a faithful life according to the precepts found herein? Or if you have done that, but you've not been living by this book, let's get back to it. Let's, let's begin to be known again as Bible-believing people. In order to do that, we've got to understand and know what it says. And in order to do that, we have to study our Bibles, don't we? If we can help you in any way, won't you come while together we stand and sing?